Amen and amen. You may be seated. It's good to see you this morning. It's nice to feel the cool air when you come in the building this morning. And about ready, stepped out about six o'clock, and it was just muggy as it could be in Magnolia. Came back out about 45 minutes later, and the cool air was there. It just made me smile. Amen. It's amazing how little things can change your attitude sometimes. It is good to see you today. I'm glad you're here to worship with us. So we're starting a sermon series entitled Breaking Free from habitual sins. Now, I know that's not anybody's problem here today. (laughs) Right? So, somebody borrowed my glasses. I put them right there. I I told you it's been one of those mornings. But I want to talk about this because I think it's very important. Uh, A lot of people, when they hear a sermon title like that, say, oh, that's going to really be good for the alcoholics in the crowd. (laughs) Or the drug addicts. They really need that sermon on breaking free from habitual sins. But if we were just to attempt to be honest a little bit, Without raising our hands, how many of you have some things in your life that you just always do that you wish you didn't do and that are just habitual sins? Uh, We are are creatures of habit. In fact, that's the way we learn through our mind, through things of repetition, ingrains things like walking, right? That's how you learn to walk. You, You got up, you started doing, you continue to do it. And now, you know, before where you had to think about which foot went first or where and how and getting your balance is just a natural, normal thing for you. It's just an, an action of habit. So there are, you know, that's, that's a good thing that the mind works that way, but we, we all have habits. I mean, just take, for instance, to uh, humor me a little bit. Uh, some of you already do, but those who don't, cross your arms right quick. Come on, come on, I'm waiting for everybody to cross. Some of you having trouble with that, aren't you? You <laughs> just can't follow instructions, can you? All right, now cross your arms the other way. Some of you had to struggle with that, it looks like. <laughs> Some of you still hadn't got it down yet. All right. The idea, because it's just not, we, you normally will cross your arms the same way you cross. You usually start when you shave, gentlemen, those who, who do that. Uh, you'll start on the same side of your face. It's just, we're just creatures of habit like that. It's just the, it's the way we're wired. It's the way we're geared. Unfortunately, we develop in the process of all those things some really bad habits. You know, things that we, 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 we started that we probably shouldn't have ever started. Now that they have been started, they're, they're ingrained in, into our, our life. So everything is, it begins in some form of repetition, and we, we pick it up from there. It was a Christian author by the name of Erwin Lutzer who made the statement, Christians must see that bad habits are ultimately spiritual issues. And I think if we can see that, then that's the only way that we can break some of these habits that, that are part of our life. There's a, there's, there's a lot of sinful behavior. It gets ingrained into our life and becomes a a bad habit. And how do we break those bad habits is pretty much the the thrust and the heartbeat of of what we want to talk about in this particular series of of breaking these habits. But how many things, I mean, as you you think about life and yourself or even people you know, I mean, how many things have just been affected by other people's bad habits? I mean, how many families have been destroyed because of bad habits? How many marriages have been divided because of someone's bad habits? How many relationships have ultimately been destroyed because of bad, bad habits? I was having a conversation with my brother-in-law just yesterday. We were really heartbroken here about some news of somebody that we knew and were talking about you know, their, their potential in life and the great mind that they had and how it was just wasted because of their bad habits. And now there was so much possibility for some individuals and just do these bad habits. Lives are lost. Sometimes jobs are lost. You get really honest, it affects us on so many different levels and so many different ways. And so I want to deal with this issue of of bad habits and how how do we break the bad habits. This first part within the series will be the power of sin. And I think Christians sometimes really aren't as educated in, this, in, in, in these biblical principles as they need to be, and therefore they continue to carry around a lot of these habits in their life. Our verse we'll look at today, first and foremost, is from Hebrews 12, when he says here, the writer is saying, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance or patience or perseverance the race that is set before us. Great passage of scriptures. Let's take the context of it first. This is the the writer, and he's writing to the church to remind them of all those people who have walked with God before them. And he goes back into the Old Testament in chapter 11. He's talking about all these, these personalities, these men and these women and these children, these people who lived a life of faith. 
people who face great challenges, who face peril and sword and famine, who face giants and, I mean, persecution, martyrdom on every level. And the whole of chapter 11, we call it the hall of faith, fame. In other words, there are people of great faith and fame there who made their stand and did great exploits for God, all right, because of their faith in God. And so he says, I want you to consider this great cloud of witnesses. Now, there's two approaches to this passage. I've I've heard a lot of preachers uh, use both. One is a popular theory, which says he's referring to all those people who we know or all those we don't know in even who are believers who have gone on to be with the Lord. And it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're in a, you're in a stadium and they're all up there and they're watching, you know, you, you, you have this great arena or this venue filled with thousands of thousands of people. Amen. Kind of like the, the minute made. How about those Astros, by the way? Amen. So, so all these people are watching and cheering what was going on. Uh, But I I really don't think that's the essence of that chapter 12. I think he's saying these people have seen and witnessed that God is faithful. They've seen that God can be trusted. And even when things were terrible in their lives and everything was going the wrong direction, they didn't doubt God. They held on to God. And they're there to tell you, keep pressing on. They're there to tell you, you can trust God. They're there to witness that you can go on with God. Now, whichever is true, and there might be some element maybe to both that that there are people in heaven who are watching us, but I'm like a bad rerun, so I don't think they're going to watch along. So maybe your life thinks you're you're interesting enough for Moses and Abraham and Paul and them to be taking note. So I'm not real big on that particular theory. Uh, It'd be like watching, never mind, we'll go on another show. (laughs) That is that we have, there are those who've gone before us who've seen the power of God and who've borne testimony that we're not following myths and fables. These are realities and we can trust them and depend upon the Lord. And he says, listen, since there's so many that have finished this race that we are in now and we are running this race, listen, they're giving testimony to us that we're we're going to make it to the end and their lives themselves ought to be like a cheering section as we study their lives. There's a couple of key phrases I want you to catch here. Number one is this, is that let's run with endurance the race that's set before us. The second phrase has to do with that is this. So let's get rid of, let's lay aside the sin that so easily entangles us, that so easily holds us captive and wraps us up and trips us up. So it says for, that, that sin forms a crippling hindrance to the race you're running, your Christian life. I mean, there, there, there is in, in Scripture this clear uh, uh, illustration of our life being like a race, that there's a finish line we're in, we're going to reach and we're going to press on into eternity in victory with the Lord. But we need to be living a consistent life now. And it's, it's just like running a, a, a long distance race. I mean, the author here obviously doesn't have a little quick sprint in mind. He's got the idea of a long distance race that requires patience. It requires endurance. It requires perseverance. It requires persistence. That's what we're a part of. So we don't bail out. We don't give up. But we also realize if we're going to be running such a long race, there's, there's things that, you know, that, you know, we don't want to run in our cowboy boots. You know, you don't want to run in your heavy jeans. You don't want to run with your jacket on. There's, this, is, this is a long-term race. The things that would entangle you are the things that would hinder you from running effectively. He said, you need to deal with those things. All right. And he's giving reference to those who've gone on before us that they learn the importance of dealing with the sin issue. And please understand that I know it is the nature of every person in this room, including myself. It's the nature of every one of us that lost or saved. It's the nature of every one of us to be easily entangled by sin, easily trapped, easily caught. It happens so easily. It can just, it, it, it occurs. And frankly, I believe there are even certain sins which people are more easily entangled with in their life than maybe somebody else is. But it's not to say that the other person is not easily entangled, maybe not by not the particular sin you're dealing with, but it'd be one that they're dealing with. In fact, I believe each one of our lives, we have this propensity for specific sins, you know, specific kinds of sin. Because in the past, Perhaps before we met the Lord, we we cultivated bad habits, which have now kind of ingrained themselves into our life. They they plague us even after we've come to Christ, they're a hindrance to us. It could be even that even after we've come to the Lord in times of spiritual weakness, we weren't mature, we weren't going to the Lord. 
after we became Christians, we continued developing some bad habits, some sinful habits, certain things in our life that easily entangle us now that we might not have had a problem with at one time in our life. Now those things are easily entangling us, easily wrapping us true. But I believe every Christian, and it won't be the same for you or for me or for some other person most likely, but each of us have certain sins that can easily capture us. And, you know, it, and we know it's true that all sin can entangle us, but I believe there are specific things. Uh, not all sin that we would set back and would call our personal entangling sins, not all sin, but there are personal besetting sins. And even as I say that, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, I haven't even said what it is is bugging you, entangling you, but you know what it is. You're aware of what's been going on. And when we talk about these in sins that easily entangle us, I think we're talking really about, even as we said in the title, personal besetting sins. What's that one area? It just seems that, you know, you're, heart, you're a Christian, you love the Lord and, and you commit it and you're just heartbroken that you did it again. And so you repent and you're broken, but man, a day, two days, a week later, you did it again. And so you come to the altar and you weep before the Lord and you confess it and then but you go your way. And somewhere down the road, there you are, caught in this vicious cycle again of these, these habitual sins. And, you know, uh, th th those, those personal things, habitual sins. Not all, all sins will fall into that category, but all general sins, all, all sins seem to have a, a sway with us. And so as we talk about this, and uh, there's some simple points I want to make today about the power of sin and why it is so powerful and why we come to these kind of things. Because I think it might help us understand that, one... That just because you've been a Christian for any length of time doesn't mean that you're not going to have to deal with sin. As long as you're in this fleshy body, as long as you're in this present world, you're going to have to deal with issues. And you're going to have to deal with sins. And if you're not careful, some things can become habitual, persistent, nagging sin in your life. But the beauty of this is if we can learn to hear what God is saying to us and have a sensitive heart and a sensitive spirit, we can become free. God can do a work of liberating our lives if we would but let him, all right? So I want to look at this, and I think there's three simple points I want to make about, about sin this morning that would be good to take note of even in your own life. One is that sin has great power over our flesh. It easily entangles us because it has such an influence in us. It exerts strong influence on our will. It exerts a strong influence on our, our emotions and upon our affections. In fact, it rarely will struggle. You know, it, it, it rarely suggests things to us. It always does what? It always commands us. It's like it's, as we say in our notes here, it's, it's like it's pushing from the rear. It's like it's pushing even internally. It's not that it's coming at me from out here so much as it's coming in from here. And we're fighting this battle right here. Galatians says this, and it's a powerful scripture. It says that the flesh sets its desires against the spirit. They are in opposition to one another. So you may not do the things you please. Now, if you've been here for the last couple of Sundays, we've talked about this spiritual being that once we give our life to Christ, that we become. You you open your heart to Christ. The Spirit of God comes into you. He makes you a new person. You're a new creation. What is that? You're a spiritual being now. That doesn't happen automatically. That happens when you make a choice for Christ. When you choose the Lord Jesus Christ, that was his, the understanding when he said, hey, you must be born again. That's spiritual birth he's talking about. And that happens in that instance when you fully commit your heart to Jesus. I'm giving my life. I'm following Christ. We call it repentance and faith. You turn from your sin, you turn to the Savior. What happens? Boom, a miracle takes place. You become a new creation in Christ. Old things pass away, all things become new. But guess where they became new at? Right in here, right? Unfortunately, where they became new, it's inside me. <laughs> and I still have this old body, and I still have to deal with this old nature. Now we understand the Bible says we've been dealt a death blow to the old nature. But hey, as long as we're in this fleshy body, we're going to have to deal with that. And the death blow means n not that it's gone away, but the power and the influence it had before is now different. That where I, before I had to yield to those things, I don't have to yield to those things now. 
I choose to yield to them. And he says very clearly, your flesh sets its desire against the spirit. In other words, the things that you're, you want to do in your flesh, your old nature, your old person, they're not the same things that God wants you to do. And that, in fact, those desires are against everything God wants to do. And if you, you don't have to be saved very long to realize that's real true, amen? That there are things that you don't want to do that you, you know you shouldn't do, and you know it's contrary to the desires of the Spirit. And you have to make choices, and decisions have to be made. All too often, the flesh is where the choice is made, and those things are in opposition to what the Spirit says and what the Spirit wants. And the apostles making it very clear here, you can't live the way you used to live your life if you're going to have victory. Just because your flesh wants to do something doesn't mean you should do it. And just because there's a desire to do it, you need to realize that sin is ever present in your flesh. So you, you most likely shouldn't do it. And so the, the, the conflict is on. But we have to realize this opposition and the beachhead for this conflict where it takes place is within our hearts and within our flesh. And it's, it's not so much sin on the outside with the world and the devil only kind of force their way in on you from the outside. No, your flesh, your old life, it is a ready ally for sin. He doesn't have to look far, far to find a friend behind the, behind the front line here. My own flesh will betray me. My own flesh will betray the Lord because it is empowered ultimately by these wicked desires of sin. It's a very powerful force, and it finds its way in our flesh, and it finds in our flesh a very willing ally, a very so-called, say, a receptive environment to be disobedient to God. It's powerful. But the second point I want you to catch here about sin is this. It easily entangles us. Why? Because it is so close. It's more than just forcing its way from the outside powerfully on our flesh. It forces its way on our flesh as it were from within us, from within your very flesh. That's where, where it is present. It's close to our being. He says the sin which so easily entangles us. The better translation it would be the sin that easily surrounds us. That it is so present, it is so easy. So it's, it's not, a lot of people think if I can just somehow do away with this and do away with that and get rid of that person because they're a bad influence or, or, or get away from that. It's like the guy who says, I'm just tired of this. I'm going to run, be a hermit or a monk. I'll just get up in my little, you know, little robe here and I'm going to go into some desert place. And when those who travel to Israel with us, uh, when we're traveling to Israel and we make our way through the Judean desert part, there are places up in the wilderness out there where these monks have gone. And they seclude themselves so as to avoid sin. The problem is they took it with them. It's in their flesh. You can't just, I mean, if you're the only person around, you're still going to sin. If there's no TV, no pornography, no music, nothing else to sway you, no, nothing to buy from the, from the outside, the devil's really still working in your flesh. And sometimes we think that we're just bigger than that or better than that. And we can certainly end up being disappointed, don't we? Because what we try to do many times is to fight this influence, this power of sin that is so present with our flesh. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pull myself up. I'm stronger than that. I'm bigger than that. I'm disciplined. And you try on your own, and what happens? You always fail. The best result of that would just be more pride in your life. <laughs> Look what I've achieved. Look what I've done. Look how spiritual I am. Well, we know what the root of that all is. Amen. Sin. <laughs> It's so close. And it, in fact, it's in your very being. It's why we need a redeemer and why we need a deliverer and why we need a savior and why we have a Lord who loves us to inhabit now this body by the presence of his Holy Spirit and to birth new life into us so that we can overcome these things. Jeremiah put it like this. Can an Ethiopian change his skin? Can a leopard, it's not possible, change his spots? You can't change the color. You say, oh, well, I can go to the tanning booth or I can bleach my skin or whatever else you want to do. Hey, the Ethiopian's still the Ethiopian. The leopard's still in that. Well, I can skin him. Well, he's not worth much skin, is he? <laughs> it's just what, and we have to understand that by nature, we are sinners. It's just what we are. Now, we don't have to, be, to use that and say, well, I guess just, just the way I am. I'm going to live it. No, he said, listen, now there's freedom in Christ. Now you can be free. For the, whom the sun sets free is free. Say that again. 
Indeed. Now that just means certainly so. That also means in action, in life, in every aspect of your life, you are free indeed. And Satan wants to sell us the other bill of goods. just saying, well, that's just the way I was born. That's the way I was raised. I've done that ever since I was a kid. You can be free. You can experience freedom. And I would think most Christians know that because they've achieved so much freedom already in so many areas of their life. So that ought to stand as a witness to you. Hey, God took you out of that. He'll take you out of this next deal. God walked you through that. He'll walk you through this. God gave you strength over there. He'll give you strength in this. We can trust the Lord with this deal. We don't have to give up and say, there's really just no hope for me. It's all is lost. I, I just can't do any better. It's just, I'm just what I am. Well, certainly it's what you am, but you also am something else. You am a believer, all right? I, bear with me, English teachers. It makes the point. The point is, you, you just can't change the internal sinfulness that's part of your life any more than the leopard can change its spots. It's not going to happen. It's part of what you are, and it is very powerful, and it does find that this ready ally in your flesh because your flesh is fallen, and the flesh always will have a propensity for sin until we stand before the Lord with new and glorified bodies. Then we'll be absent from it. Jeremiah 17 put it this way. The heart is desperately wicked. Another passage sounds a little tamer. The heart is deceitful. Still the same thing. The heart is deceitful. Now, the third point I want you to catch about sin and the way it works, it doesn't remain separate once you come to Christ. It mingles in all your motives. It's part of all of your actions. In fact, we said a while ago, the Greek for this word literally means the sin which so easily stands around us. It's just there. It's, 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 it's an easy go-to. It's the first reaction, right? It's the first thing we're, we're, we're prone to. It's, it's, it's the way we've always gone that way. I mean, we've been grained and entrained and, and, and bred in sin so that it's the natural inclination to, to make a wrong choice, to go a wrong way, to make a bad decision, to say the wrong thing, to do the wrong thing, because it's so accessible. God is also now accessible in our lives. Luther put it this way. He says, you know, it is the sin which always so clings to us. He wrote sinful propensity always surrounding us, ever present and ready. So sin is powerful. Sin is near. It's near and that is in us. And it isn't categorically separated. In other words, there's no place where you just kind of draw a line and say, okay, this is where my righteousness is and here's where my unrighteousness is. This is where my, my, this is where this starts and between the good and the bad of my life. No, there's this uniqueness about sin and the fallen nature. It just has this way of weaving itself into so many areas of our life and even to the very fabric of our duties. It affects our motives. It affects our thoughts. It affects our actions. It affects just about every aspect. It entangles itself with our purposes and even, as I say, with our motives of some, our, our plans. And even my very best deeds can be affected by sin because if I'm not careful, even that becomes an area of pride in my life. So we're fighting on a big front here. Can I get some agreement, amen? amen. This is n- n- not a battle. In fact, in Romans 7, Paul cries out, oh, wretched man that I am. You know, why? Because no matter how hard I try, I just can't disentangle myself from sin. We just overcome easily, entangled. And as I said, there's certain sins which seem more easily entangled us than others. You'll deal with some things that I might not deal with, but you're dealing with, and they're real. I'm dealing with some other stuff. But the, beauty, and the beauty of this is there is an answer. Now, if you look at the whole of the book of Romans, I, one of my favorite books in the Bible, in Romans chapter 1 and 2 and 3, is just talking about we're all sinners, children of wrath, separated from God, worthy of judgment. In chapters 4, he starts saying, but God's opened a door for us by faith. And chapter 5 says, now we can have peace with God and access to God by faith. But God sent his son to die for us so we can know life because but we enter in by faith and we start this new relationship. In chapter 6, he starts talking about how you're this new creation. You've been baptized in the body of Christ. All right, now you're this, this new being and sin's no longer your master. So you don't have to do what it tells you to do. That now you should submit your body to the Lord and allow your, your, your body to become an instrument of righteousness because you're in Christ now. And it's just looking great until you get to chapter 7. 
And he says, you know, I'm finding myself that I do the things I don't want to do, and the things I do want to do, those are the things I don't do. He says, this is terrible. He says, is there any answer? Who's going to deliver me from this body of sin? Oh, wretched, wicked man that I am. Now, understand the book of Romans was a letter, right? It wasn't written in chapters and verses. That was done in later centuries to, for us to access different parts for Bible study. So he's writing this letter, and it's like this testimony is being given. And we're talking about, here's great, the apostle Paul, man, he's just, he's something else, man. He's even been ascended to the third heaven. He's seen God, all right? He's had a personal encounter with Jesus on Damascus Road. This guy's just, you know, uh, it's amazing. He gets bit by snakes, and the most venomous poison snake in the world doesn't bother him. He just shakes it off. Even his shadow, when he goes by, seems to heal somebody. This guy's that's top shelf, isn't it? I'll take that testimony. All too often, I think I have the other side of that testimony. What a wretched man. What a wretched man. What a wretched woman. I mean, have you ever felt that way? You think, man, I've been saved. And here I, can't, I just fell in that same stupid hole again. It's like David says in Psalms, what a dumb beast I am. In other words, David said, my dog's smarter than I am. That's some real in-depth honesty, Amen. But I think that's where we have to come to. And if we never come to that, then we'll never get real about it. You have to come to the place where Paul says, I can't do this alone. And then when he gets into chapter 8, he starts talking about some of the things we're going to deal with in the coming weeks. Where he's talking about, hey, there's two laws in operation here. One is the law of sin and death. And that's what I'm accustomed to. But there's another law of the spirit of life, grace, and liberty that I'm discovering. It's a very real principle. It's like the law of gravity. You know? If we, we know that if we jump on top of this 35, 40 foot building at the peak, if I jump off, something's going to happen. Anybody want to guess? I'm not going to float off. It's not because I'm such a big fat slob. It's because of the law of gravity. I'm going to come tumbling down quickly. It's a real law, is it right? Yeah. They say Newton discovered the law of gravity. I think it was well around before then. <laughs> I think God created it. Holds everything in place. Yes. Amen. You think you would have done something about teenagers, but when they're willing. So there's all, but there's another law that overrides that law of gravity. It's the law of aerodynamics. Yeah. It, over, it doesn't take away gravity. Gravity's still there. It's just greater. And he said there's a law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that sets us free. It's greater than the law of sin and death. Yes. Yes. All right. And this is where we're going to be heading to in our study. And this is where Paul finds out he doesn't stop and live his life in Romans chapter 7. He goes forward to say, we're all dealing with this issue. Here's how we're at it. Here's how we can disentangle it. Here's how the freedom comes. In 2 Corinthians, he says something similar to this, where he talks about we're easily entangled. Now let's lay aside the sin from Hebrews 12. Now let us cleanse ourselves of the filthiness of the flesh. Boy, in, any witness here that would be honest enough to say, there, yeah, there is the filthiness of the flesh. If I'm left to myself, I'll just create a havoc and a wreck and ruin my life and ruin other people's life if I'm just left to myself without any discipline or any commitment in my life. He goes on in Ephesians, Paul writes this, we lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Now pay attention to that verse. He's saying here, we're laying aside that old self as part of how we're going to participate in the law of so-called spiritual aerodynamics. We lay aside the old self. Why? Because... He doesn't say it is corrupted or it was corrupted. What does it say? It is. In other words, your flesh is not going to get any better no matter how long you've been saved. And a lot of people think, well, you know, I'm just going to get this place in my life. It's just going to put on glorification somewhere in this world. You know, there, there's certain denominations that preach that sanctification as an instant sanctification. In other words, it's just where you won't want to sin anymore. And you won't sin anymore. Well, I haven't met that guy yet. And I'm sure if I run into him in heaven, he's going to say, oops. <laughs> yeah, that was a, my bad. Because <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. Now, we become more disciplined. We become more mature. We, we, we have, we have we're learning how to get rid of the old habits and have new spiritual disciplines in our life. But this guy here, the old guy, you get one centimeter away from Jesus and the cross of Christ and the spirit of God in your life, you're going to make a miserable wreck. And you'll be just everything you ever were before. So don't think that somehow your flesh is going to get better. It doesn't. It's being corrupted. 
Romans, he goes on to say here, he writes the church, and this is part of that Romans chapter 6, don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey. In other words, it's there, but don't let it reign. It has its desires, but you don't respond to them. You don't let those things control your life. He goes on, Peter says it this way. He said, listen, lay aside all evil. Verse 11, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. We're saying cleanse, lay aside, don't let, abstain, lay aside. Isaiah puts it this way. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. What's he saying? Look at these words. I mean, it, it's, you got to make some decisions. Whether it's the cleansing or the washing, we'll discover as we do this study, that comes from the Word of God. So you can't do this without God's Word. And we discover also that it comes by, by being purified by the Holy Spirit. It only comes by the Holy Spirit. So we can't do it apart from the Holy Spirit. We can't do it apart from Jesus. It's, in other words, I'm not relying on myself to do the washing and the cleaning. I'm trusting the Lord at my life, with my life, and I'm getting rid of the stuff that's a hindrance. I'm laying aside the things that so easily entangle me, and now I'm beginning to run the race with perseverance. Like, obviously, the biggest question to all that is, how do we do that? Well, from a practical standpoint, we know, yes, it is the work of the Holy Spirit. And if you walk in the Spirit, as Scripture says, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. But I think there's understandings that you need to get a hold of and principles of truth that you need to believe and claim for your own life or it will never happen. Ultimately, the only way for freedom is that you give all the credit, you know, to the Lord and to the Holy Spirit in your life. He, he's the only one by surrendering him, by not letting sin reign, but the Lord reign, by not letting self reign, but the spirit be in charge. And those are those are willful decisions and they're daily decisions. It's, me doing this today is not good for tomorrow. I gotta do it again tomorrow. We see that Jesus daily sought the father's face. We even learn from the Lord's prayer. Give us this day our our what kind of bread? It doesn't say cinnamon toast. I'll take some of that. Our daily bread, our daily consumption of God, our daily consumption of his word, our daily consumption of, of yielding to him in our life. And ultimately we realize that we give all the credit to him and to the Holy Spirit. But we do have a responsibility to come to the place where we are yielding to the spirit, laying aside and putting aside and saying yes. We're looking unto Jesus, as it says in this passage, the author and the finisher of our faith. Looking unto who? Not myself. You can do this, arms. You got this, man. You're tough. You're bold. You've, got, you've been strong, man. No, you're looking unto Jesus, the author. What does that mean? What's that mean? Paul put it this way in another place. He which began a good work in you, he's the author. He, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's also the finisher. It starts with him, it ends with him. You say, how does it get there from there to there? By him. He put it in another place, it's of him, through him, and to him. That's the way we live today. And that's the way you'll live tomorrow. And that's where your victory is going to be found. And that's where your strength is discovered. And that's where the victory comes in your life in real practical ways because it is now, it's unto Jesus. I remember an illustration, I think it was Tim, the first time I heard this illustration, shared it in one of our, our meetings or services or somewhere, you know, and he says some good stuff every once in a while, you know. <laughs> but he used the illustration, you probably may have heard as well, about circus elephants, you know, that they train for the circus. And, you know, when the, you, you've been to the circus, perhaps, I know they're getting rid of all the elephants and stuff in the circuses, but when you, those of you who remember those kind of things, or you saw the TV show, all right? You remember, these, you, you see, you go and the big elephant, massive creatures, mounts of strength is just, you know, phenomenal. They, they have a big chain around their ankle, and then they're staked, a stake in the ground, and the chain's connected to that stake, all right? Now, I, I, the first time I think I ever saw that, I thought, Oh, that stupid elephant. He could easily reach over his trunk and pull that out if he wanted to. He's got that much strength. Or just give it a little tug, it's coming out. I remember we took the kids to a circus, one of these little mom and pop circuses up in the Humble one year, and they were, had one guy out there and the elephant's there, and he had, it's steak wasn't maybe that long, and he's driving it in the ground out there, you know. That, that, they're going to stop that elephant. But that elephant... He won't pull against it anymore. 
Because when they're babies and they first bring them in, they do the same thing. They take a stake, they drive in the ground, they chain that little elephant's leg to it. And all that little elephant, that little baby elephant, as he's growing up now, he knows if he pulls against that, because he's young and he's weak and he's small, it ain't going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. And so he just develops this mindset from this habitual trying and nothing happening. So now anytime he would feel some resistance there, he doesn't do anything about it. Because he can't pull it out of the ground, even though he can. Because he's been told from ever since he was just a little child, you can't do that. His environment has dictated that to him. And so that massive elephant who could easily pull that stake out of the ground doesn't do it. I think the first time I heard that, I thought, that's me. I'm that stupid elephant. Well, don't look at me like that. It's you too. I mean... How often do we just sit there, chained around the ankle, so to say, stayed where we were because we didn't think we could do anything about it. And all the time, the, the Lord said, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And Jesus said, you shall know the truth and you shall be free. The Bible says we are no longer slaves to sin, so no longer yield your body as an instrument in the righteous, of, of unrighteousness, but now yield yourselves and your members of your body as instruments to righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, according to Romans 6. But we're like that elephant. Ah, oh, what's the use? I just don't think it's going to work. Jesus is the author and the finisher. In other words, if he told you you can, you can. If he told you it's possible, well, you know, I've had this thing around my whole life. Who are you going to believe? And who are you going to put your trust in? Oh, I'm pulling, man, I'm pulling. Hey. Why don't you turn around and say, hey, the Lord hath said. And you'll find that we do not have to constantly find ourselves in bondage to the chains that are tied around our spiritual ankles in life. We've been set free in Christ. So we'll be talking about those principles. I've talked enough today. And I am sure that as I've spoken, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit's work in all of us to bring to our heart and mind the very thing that we need to deal with in our life. And I want to encourage you, instead of being like the elephant today, you'd realize there's a great possibility in the power of the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ to, to, to literally save and deliver us that you can be free. Would you stand with me this morning as our heads are bowed?